three. This is the Generative Commons call on Wednesday, August 11th, 2021. Um, so a couple things, Stacey. Um, yes. You're describing it in a different way, some stuff that's kind of already in the waters here um, in a couple ways. Uh, one of them is that I'm trying to figure out how to pitch people to attract money into OGM, uh, part of which is to fund internal projects that we would scope out and say, okay, if, if someone will build this under, you know, uh, with these guidelines of, and these deliverables, then we'll, we'll actually get them real money, not, not, not play money or cryptocurrency, which would actually also be interesting um, to do so. And it's, it's basically one of the puzzle pieces of this better all singing, all dancing infrastructure we need that I don't think can be done by one platform that needs to be a, it needs to be a patchwork quilt. Thank you, Hank. Um, for it needs to be a patchwork quilt of a variety of different pieces of software and other sorts of things. And that's, I'm trying to figure out how to describe the role that OGM plays as the quilting bee dance caller, if I can mix metaphors for you. Um, then the second thing is that Phelan More Life, um, who's been in uh, a, a few of our check in calls and a couple of, and some of the uh, Jerry's, uh, free Jerry's brain calls. He has a startup that he's, I think he's managed to fund called Virgence, and it was called Virgence AR, but I said, why don't you just call it XR, uh, which is, you know, ex extreme reality, uh, uh, extended reality, whatever you want to call it. But basically in the space that you just said, um, oh, okay, good. So you, <laughs> you, you've, you've spoken with him. I just saw your chat back. So you yes, spoke with him. <laughs> exactly. And so, and so he's the closest thing in the OGM set of orbits that is doing something pretty much like what you said. And then actually third thing, um, which I wanna talk about here is that um, the latest incarnation of how to make OGM actually work and actually fundable that, that is in my head right now um, is that we, we run a show and the show looks, smells and looks like a podcast and a vlog on the surface called Weaving the World. But under the surface, we're busy connecting up the ideas and mapping them, connecting communities and having important conversations. And it's the process, not the end product that matters. And in so doing, we're sort of uh, doing a reality show under the hood because we're reporting in and working openly on everything we're doing underneath. As we weave the mycelial links in the rhizomal networks of the great estuary that is the, you know, the, the place we're moving toward. Was that enough metaphors? Um, I, feel like, I feel like on a metaphor per sentence uh, kind of metric, I could do pretty well. Uh, go ahead, Stacey. So what about if we just step back and instead of weaving, we were actually creating? Well, uh, weaving is a form of creation, right? And, um, and I think what you're saying is that when, where this hits the real world is really important, which is I think why you're bringing augmented reality into the, 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 the mix here which I agree with entirely. And I think some of that, I think a, a piece of that is in fact that exploration. Now, separately, um, I have written a draft. Uh, it's not a great draft. Pete had some really good critiques of it. I've written a draft document I can share with you. Let me just find the tab uh, and give you a link. I have written a draft of a set of challenges that I've wanted to issue to OGMers and others for a long time um, to basically, uh, here's the document. So um, we've, uh, the, the brain has an export function. So we dumped, we dumped all, the, uh, all the data from my brain. And it turns out that that export is a big bag of JSON objects, basically tuples wrapped in, in a pretty familiar wrappers. Um, and we've put that in a, in a database somewhere uh, uh, on a server. And what I'd like to do is issue a challenge to anybody who wants to come along and say, hey, treat this data like sourdough starter. And then here's a bunch of different levels at which um, you might want to explore with, uh, experiment with this data. One layer at the top, I put user, user interface. What, what does it look like for a person to feed a brain? Like how do we make that easier, faster, uh, lighter, uh, right now, the brain is very daunting. One of, the, one of the brain's problems for 23 years has been uptake. People look at it, they're like, that's kind of cool, and then they don't stick. And I looked at it, and I stuck immediately for 23 years. But I'm, I'm weird that way, right? And other people are not necessarily. But if you bounce down a couple, you'll see that ARXR is a layer inspired by a Phelan's project and other things that are clearly possible. 
and I'm and 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 I had a conversation years ago with a fellow from Google who was a, a hardware engineer in the Google Glass team. And the, we figured out very quickly that the Google Glass, as it was living then, this is the Google. Google had already deprecated the project in public, but they were still working on it, you know, inside. Um, and it, we figured out pretty clearly that there's not enough resolution in Google Glass to to usefully use the brain out in the world. But then we had a really interesting conversation about what would that be like? What would it be like? if you had knowledge of your geolocation and then you could identify objects and people in front of you, what if your context could show up around you as you moved in the world? What if you could annotate the world as Phelan is, is doing and a bunch of other things, right? That's kind of interesting, even just right there. So that layer of this Free Jerry's Brain Challenge experiment is meant to be, hey, everybody, you could add in some, you could use machine learning to add in location data, metadata, you could use pattern recognition, whatever to figure out where you are and what you're looking at, and then go to town with, with what's going on here and actually weave this information into the world and, and leave a trail like uh, the path makers that, that Vergence is, is, uh, wants to put in the world, right, as a game. And, and if we do all this right, then the data layer at the bottom of these layers kind of, uh, the data layer winds up being fed and nurtured by everybody doing this because instead of, uh, and. Uh, I don't think Phil and I have talked about it this, at this length, but with that, with with luck, if this is designed right, as people leave new trails in Phelan's game, that data isn't kept in a proprietary game database. That data actually is put out into the data commons, where <clears throat> um, I can look at it with the brain uh, and, and sort of uh, and map it in and, and connect it. And you could look at it with Kumu or Miro or whatever, and still use that data that's being left around. It would be a shared asset, right? That, that from the perspective of Phelan's game would look like an, an extended reality experience in the world, but then all that, rich, all that rich data, all the markers that are left in the world would be for all of us to, to sort of use in, in more interesting ways. <clears throat> and that, I, so that's like eight things. Sorry, I went on for, for all the different <laughs> things, but, but what you're saying fits all of these things which are kind of around us few of which are actually real things yet, right? I haven't funded or started weaving the world yet. Uh, and then uh, one last thing, uh, the thing that weaving the world would be weaving is the big quilt. And I think, I, I think that that then, you know, you know, I think that that then is the separate shared commons asset for the world. And our, our name for it would be something like the, the, the big quilt. Somebody else might call it something else, uh, but that would help us kind of separate the podcast show thing from the asset itself, the shared asset meant to be for the commons. And one of the nice things about Lionsburg and being a sponsee is that we could very credibly stand up a big quilt foundation, for example, to go do that. Oh, and the last thing I wanted to add, I wanted to go back to the top to the OGM fund, which is uh, the pitch that I've got developed so far is, hey, up to half a million dollars uh, would be a budget that where, where we could set up, where we could set up a, a bunch of projects to fund that would build some of the missing pieces in what we see. If we get more than that up, like let's say another half million up to a million, that goes into an OGM fund, which goes to organizations that have projects that are building out parts of this. So I think it's it's kind of what you were saying earlier. It's a <clears throat> it's a it's a an entrepreneurial investment fund for the commons and for companies to design their products toward the commons. So Please. Yeah, I just want to repeat what I said before the recording, and I want Hank to hear it. Yeah. Um, I want to, because also, keep in mind, I'm focused on the muggles. So the part of that you just explained, that's for, you know, the back end. But now on the front end, um, I had mentioned, Hank, that I was thinking, uh, the way I would describe it is a cross between the apprentice and American Idol, where regular people can come and pitch their projects and, you know, depending on who wins, you know, who's, who has the best pitches, they then lead a team of the other people who didn't win. So they're still in the game. So you have all these people coming and they get profiled. So we're weaving stories, we're learning, you know, we make sure, you know, we design it so that we're handpicking people that are involved in different social um, causes as well. You know, it, it's, all, it's all designed. Like Jerry didn't like that I had to use the apprentice, but I think that we actually have to because it's proven success. We just have to use it with the morality built into it. 
<laughs> the ethics built in. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think it's really interesting. Uh, I sort of started taking my own notes here uh, when you were describing three teams and I got the first team was building an augmented reality video game. The second team building an educational system, did you say? Yes, that, that's where we have more of the academics, the storytellers, the creative writers, the people interested in producing films, um, you know, and that, you know, that would take care of those types of creative endeavors. Whereas like Fallon's project would work more with the technical people. Yeah. But it would all tie in and it would all crisscross. And then we have our community. Could you explain to me the relationship between the video game and the educational system? Basically, it's just a way to create two different projects that I think will be able to tie in all these loose ends. Is the educational system the same or similar to Jerry's uh, interwoven podcast and the reality show for knowledge? No, I'll give you an example of something that I was going to actually talk to Barry Court about today. Something that I think that I might want to try and do on my own. And um, it's this, this is actually about storytelling. So for example, this would be like for little kids. Let's take the, the story of Cinderella and let's put in, you know, um, different emotional overlays and let people recreate parts of their own story. But this is, I can't explain this here. It's too complicated, but this is the work that he's done. And I think that with his help, we could put together the best team. I wouldn't be doing it. The only thing I'd be doing is putting together the best team to do that yeah. work. Is this the right Barry? I don't see you anymore. Oh, sorry. I just uh, screen shared oh, okay. the frame. Okay. Is this the right Barry? Yes. Um, please say hi. Um, I, I haven't talked to him in, in ages. I'd, and if he, it'd be fun if he wanted to join the OGM conversation, et cetera, et cetera. But I'd love to get Oh, I that. will absolutely ask him to come. We're pretty yeah. friendly. <laughs> cool. Cool, 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 cool. Um, Hank, did you have other, other thoughts or questions? I, uh, as always, I'm, I'm listening and trying to make a, a picture in my mind that makes sense to me as a sort of non-tech person uh, oriented to uh, things that will make society better. And I think what I've heard from both of you relate to that. And I'm just trying to see, are they, well, let, let, let me go to, to the OGM fund, which is really interesting. But all of the things in your list of challenges, Jerry, are too, too technical for me. But I'm sure they're, they're, all of them are yeah. worth doing. They're meant to be technical. This is for yeah. geek, this is a geeks yeah. challenge at, yeah, at, exactly. at various different different levels of design. Yes. Yeah, exactly. What's interesting is that Stacy, your challenge is not a necessarily a geeky challenge. I'm just trying to figure out how I would phrase it to my non techie friends who are. So on techie, they would never think of joining OGM calls, that it would be, it would make the world better, more interesting, give it more quality or something like that. Oh, is that a question? <laughs> yeah, that, well, it, it's sort of talking out loud saying, uh, I'm wondering, I can't yet see, but I have a feeling it's there someplace. How would your, uh, let's so say your, the, your mix of uh, Apprentice and American Idols benefit uh, America or knowledge workers or uh, our grandchildren or okay, something like so that? For, for the non-techie people, it's creating a show that actually educates as it connects 
and as it weaves in all of those wonderful values that we want, but it also uses our natural competition, but channels it in a cooperative way. Okay. I'm just trying to see if Barry wants to come on now. Mm. Uh, Stacy, you were there, or no, were you there or weren't you there on yesterday's uh, I was there. Uh, community uh, food service call? Oh, no, I wasn't there. I missed no. that now. Uh, well, it started off very interesting and then became a very frustrating experience. And I got an insight after, after it finished. And I was triggered by something you said a few minutes ago. You're not going to do it. You're just going to put the team, the right team together to do it. And that seemed to be a big sticking point yesterday. And maybe you, you agree or disagree, Jerry. Uh, some people were saying that the nine people on the call were the team to do it. Others were saying, this is not the team to do it. And we have to find the team to do it. And I'm just wondering if that's not really something on a meta level for an OGM fund or for OGM in general is exactly that. For whatever somebody wants to do, like Klaus wants to do that, and Stacy, you want to do that, and I've got things I'd like to do, and everyone has things they want to do, can OGM uh, benefit the world by getting the right people together and giving them the ball and then they run with it. Mm -hmm. um, and yesterday's call was kind of messy and bumpy, it seemed. Uh, one of the many issues was what is it, right? Yeah. Is, is this the right time to do, is this the right team to do it? Well, <laughs> depending on what the it is. And, and you know the, the people who happened to be on the the food systems call yesterday uh were a mix like some people on the ground in different parts of the world like trying to actually do food systems work uh, other people uh, coming from a very entrepreneurial perspective other people systems thinkers etc um and and my my own conclusion was we have to go through some kind of analytic process to figure out what the it is where 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 this group of humans, not a team yet, is going to apply its energy in what form. And then once we identify the it, then build a team around the it. And that, that would mean very likely recruiting some new people in with new skills, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then there'd be a team that, that's sort of going after that particular thing. Um, and, and the idea of the OGM fund is pretty much what you described. It's like, hey, how do we help form up these ventures and fund them? Yeah. And, and how do we... And, and I don't know if this is necessarily true, but how do we help form up the, the commons benefiting parts of, of all these ventures that don't necessarily have a business model canvas and a business model, but that we think if we add these features to even commercial offers, um, the world will be better off at the end. Yeah. Right? Yeah. How do, we, how, do we help, how do we help weave the parts that help nurture the commons? Go ahead, Stacey. I'm sorry, I'm trying to, Barry's asking me for the Zoom and I don't know how to send it. I'm going through all my old emails. Oh, hold on, hold on. I can give you an invite. I can uh, uh, copy. Can you, it, can you put it in his Facebook Messenger? Because uh, that's what we're talking on. Uh, can you just copy and paste that link that I just put in the yeah, Zoom? Yeah, for whatever reason, I was having, now that, okay, for, this was another thing I was going to ask you about. Yeah. Something happened to my computer, and when I click on these links, it won't click. I'm going to try. I just copy and paste it. Don't don't click it right now. Just copy it and then paste it into your chat with Barry. I know, but it's not. It's just saying select all, and then it selects the whole entire chat. Okay, you can't drag your mouse across. Oh, wait, 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 wait. No, I don't know why it's. I'll, I'll just. I'll figure it out. I'll... Hold on. Let me uh, go find Barry. Thank you. Facebook. Let me tell him you're sending. Yeah. Go find it on Facebook. Ba -ba -da -ba -da -ba. Cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. 
Poop, poop, poop. Come on, slow machine. Why are you not finding Barry? If you, uh, Stacy, if you give me uh, a WhatsApp uh, or an email address, I'll email the link to you. 27. Ooh, uh, is that, uh, that's, uh, that's WhatsApp? 27, no, it's, it's Gmail. Oh, Gmail, uh, 27? Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. O open heart. Open heart. Yeah. At gmail.com. Uh, so I just I just gave him the link uh, in the Zoom in in Messenger. So we're we're good. He should be okay. he should be joining us momentarily. Okay. okay. And I didn't even get to run this idea by him. <laughs> oh, good. I was going to do it later today. <laughs> cool. So yeah, Hank, to your point, I, I you know I want to go back and I don't understand um, you know what the problem was, but the way this whole idea works together and to have the two different tracks sort of yeah. solves for who does what and that kind of thing. It sort of separates yeah. people. Hey Barry. Hey Barry. Small world Barry. I see. Oh, you got a haircut. Yeah. <laughs> they sent around a reminder that the uh, salons are open and they were offering a $9 haircut. So I went in. <laughs> Sweet. I used to get $10 haircuts at Astor Place in New York. Yeah. It was like usually a ba like, basement usually, barbershop with like 50 chairs in it. Yeah. Usually they're like 20 bucks or something. I think less for seniors, but for $9, you know, and, and a tip, it's not, <laughs> couldn't pass it up. No True. weight. Um, so we're in the middle of a very interesting conversation. Um, this call is being recorded, just so you know. Um, cool, and my, my habit is to post them on YouTube and a few people, like a dozen people might watch it later. Um, and we're busy brainstorming. Uh, Stacy brought an idea into the conversation that marries nicely to a series of ideas that have been happening in OGM. So Open Global Mind is a thing that started at the beginning of lockdown. So it's you know, 16, 18 months old now. Um, and is about being open-minded and is about building a global brain and is sparked partly by my 23 years of feeding, you know, the brain, uh, et cetera, but then has a whole bunch of other aspects to it because um, one of the beliefs behind Open Global Mind is that uh, emotion and membership trump reason most of the time, meaning I could present to you the most beautiful, irrefutable argument in the brain or in Kumu or in something else with evidence that let, like nobody would deny, but if agreeing with me meant you would be rejected by your tribe, you would happily gaslight me and say next. Uh, and that's happening. That's like, that's what our world looks like right now, right exactly. this minute. And, and, so, and so I think there's, there's value in both, there's clearly value in both sides. There's value in trying to figure out how do we make things easier to understand uh, which could affect education, could affect governance, could affect science, could affect everything. And then how do we bridge the, the divides that, that separate us, that make us unable to trust each other enough to even look at or use the, inf you know, the information? Um, and so we're trying to do a little bit uh, all at once. And Stacey, if you want to play tag team and sort of pick up a little bit and uh, uh, put whatever parts of that you want to put back into the conversations to catch Barry up. Well, I, I actually want to answer Hank and Barry might get something from it. Um, okay. If I just remember my training. You have to re reload that yep. back in your brain. Oh, so getting to the thing with the personalities, the idea of putting it into game form is everybody gets to play their own way. That's how it's designed. And that's the important piece. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Clear. Uh, well, one uh, one additional question: Is it a zero sum game with winners and losers, or uh, does everyone win? Well, that's the thing. Everybody can win, but also everybody can win to a different degree. And it's really so. I mean, you can you can. Let's say you start off doing something your own way, and you yeah. see somebody over there seems to ha be having a much easier time. You can go and make an agreement to join them, but the group has their rules and 
So if you want to go there and they wear masks, you have to wear a mask, but you have a choice to not and not yeah. wear a mask. Yeah. Yeah, clear. The main part of this, and Barry knows bits and pieces because he knows I was trying to work on something with Michael Josefowicz that had something to do. It was a game show. It was part reality. It was part research action project. Um, so the idea really is creating a space that everybody can try out their hand at whatever it is they think they want to do, but they're doing it in community and there's a fun to it. There's a competition, um, a creativity, and everybody gets involved. You see, this is where the game part comes in, in terms of dealing with the muggles. They can weigh in the same way you like a post. So you're voting in that way. And everybody, every mother knows that the way to get a picky eater to eat is to help them create the meal. Mm -hmm. but that's <laughs> where I'm coming from on this. That makes sense. Or, and, or to hide the broccoli. <laughs> Well, I don't want, but that's the thing. Society has always tried to hide the broccoli. And kids, people like me, we don't want to be manipulated. We don't want to be lied to. Barry knows I'm always saying, I hate this idea of hiding things in stories. Interesting. <laughs> huh. Um, and uh, so uh, Barry, partly we're we're playing with like how to how to create projects that can actually do these things in the world, um, and uh, OGM is currently a fiscal sponsee of a five hundred one c three called Lionsburg, which is a fan of steward ownership. Are you familiar with steward ownership? Never heard of it. Okay, I hadn't either. Um, steward ownership is an interesting ownership model that is meant to be durable and hard to sort of hard to take over. It's a kind of impervious to hostile takeovers, et cetera. The simple version is there's a nonprofit that owns all of the shares of a for-profit. So a 501c3 owns all the shares of a C-corp. So anyone who joins this, there's no discussion about who gets diluted, who gets more shares, because all the shares are actually in the nonprofit. You can pay salaries, you can, and on top of this platform, you can do for-profit ventures or for-benefit ventures, and, uh, and also like foundational ventures, all of that. You know, this platform is good for a variety of kinds of business models. Uh, and it's really hard to take over unless you lose control of the foundation of your own 501c3. And so Lionsburg is, has, has, um, is trying to bring a bunch of other entities into this kind of ecosystem where these sorts of platforms exist. And then, and then it's trying to foster a series of, of entities that are building different parts of the modern ecosystem. Uh, and they, you know, I had a conversation with the founder of Lionsburg, a guy named Jordan, uh, some months ago during lockdown you know, in a Zoom. And um, he saw that some of the stuff that Open Global Mind was doing was of the nature of, it would feed the ecosystem he was looking for. Uh, it would make a really good candidate uh, to be on this journey. So that's kind of where we've been. And I'm at the stage now where, where we are a fiscal sponsee of his charity, of his 501c3, which means we can raise uh, grant funds for a charity. And I'm still trying to figure out what is it that I'm pitching for because in our very interesting conversations inside of OGM, this thing has sort of morphed. It's a little bit like nailing jelly to a tree, uh, which is the title of a book way back when. Um, and, and at this point, sort of my best answer to that is that I'm pitching a show that looks a little bit on the surface like a vlog or a podcast called Weaving the World, in which we're actually trying to go visit people who are, who've got world, world solutions and we're applying kind of ogm -y skills to their ideas. Uh, you know, it starts as an interview that looks like everybody else's million podcasts out there, but then we take it apart and we start connecting, uh, you know, and, and under, under the ground, we're busy creating the connections between those ideas and the rest of the ideas that other people have made. We're asking the boundary questions. We're connecting communities that seem to be working on the same thought. We're sort of doing work to enrich the idea in kind of a reality show under, under the ground where we're working openly and recording and posting our calls so anybody can come see how that work got done and be along for the ride for the building of a new environment within which uh, the, the commons is fed, uh, we can make a living sort of together by being in this environment, all those kinds of things. 
what does OGM stand for? Open Global Mind. Open Global Mind. Okay. Well, that's a lot to uh, <laughs> to chew on in three or four minutes. I know. The one thing I will say about uh, games, because um, the study of games goes back, as you probably know, to John Forbes Nash, who studied the very simplest example of a game, the two-person zero-sum game. And it's the one that was most completely analyzed and understood. And, and John Forbes Nash provided a, a, a theory and a theorem um, for how to optimally play a two-person zero-sum game. And after that, it became much more challenging to consider the multi-person non-zero-sum game, which is still game. And, and the key thing about a game is that the objective is inherently defined in the game itself. There's a scoring system of some sort in the game and the scoring system defines the objective. If you relax the notion that the game defines the objective, then you enlarge the concept of a game to something that is more commonly known as a drama. In a drama, you can have two or more characters, but each one has their own independent objective. And that the objectives are not exactly equal and opposite as they would be in a game. So in a, in a classical game, whatever I gain, the other guy loses, it's equal and opposite. But in a drama, the characters can have their own arbitrary objectives. And so I want to go this way, and the other guy maybe wants to go that way. So they're not equal and opposite. And they do have some overlap, but they also have some opposition. And, and so when you allow the objectives and the values of the players to be their own personal values and objectives, then it's, it's not a game, it's a drama. And what's interesting is that you can take the mathematical concepts that John Forbes Nash introduced with his Minimax theorem and, and this, all this mathematics, and you can, it, you can generalize the, the theory to, uh, to a, a drama theory model, which, is, which essentially is, is an expansion of, of the mathematics of John Forbes Nash. And I actually gave the theorem a name. Uh, and and I, I'll explain the name in a minute. But if I have a value, something I really want, the opposite of that is something I don't want. It's something I dread. So if you take, now it's, it's easier to think about fears than desires, but fears and desires are essentially the opposite. Whatever I fear, don't want, if I take 180 degree opposite of that, then I really want that because that moves me maximally away from what I don't want towards what I do want. So one of the ways that you can characterize characters in a drama is what do they fear and what do they desire if you watch lucifer on netflix you'll notice that lucifer asks people uh what they i can't remember one one of them the, the twins one of them asks what you do what's your greatest desire the other one asks what's your greatest fear but they're really the same question so one day i was in the airport waiting for an airplane and i I wandered past the bookstore and I saw a book title uh, by Tom Clancy, you know, the, the spy novelist. And the title on the cover was The Sum of All Fears. And that got me thinking because first of all, the sum of all sounds like a mathematical uh, beginning. Sounds, with like, mathematical an sounds like an integral, integral, yeah. Yeah, so I thought, well, suppose you have a cast of characters and they all have idiosyncratic fears which are not aligned and not opposite but they're sort of random directions how do you how do you take that and make that into a drama and so one of the ways to think about it is um it's instead of an axis imagine that i've got a plane so i put all the the fears in a two-dimensional plane it's easier to model it than in more than two dimensions so i'll put each character around the perimeter of the circle and on one direction from the center is their fear and the other direction is their desire their opposite desire so now instead of a teeter-totter which is what you have in the two-person game you have a wobbly uh plate and in order for the drama to have continuity the net vector sum of all fears has to balance to out to zero so that the 
so that the action will wobble around, but you won't have the whole thing being blown over by one character overpowering all the others. So this, this continuity theorem, I call it Clancy's theorem. And, and I take the, um, the hint from Shakespeare. Shakespeare wrote a play called Much Ado About Nothing. So yeah. the vector sum of all fears has to net balance to zero, but it's dynamic. So the plate wobbles and that's your action. So what happens is one character does an action and that triggers another character somewhere on the other side of the plate. And that character reacts, but their reaction doesn't, doesn't necessarily trigger the first character. It might go off at an oblique angle and trigger a third character who then reacts to that. And that reaction triggers a fourth character. And so this, this uh, kind of ping pong thing goes around the plate, but eventually it has to close on itself. And each time around, it's, it's a different sequence. But so this is, the, this is the, the, the vector sum of all fears is zero is essentially the extension of the Nash equilibrium. And it's easy to see it in two dimensions. You can do it in more, as many dimensions as you like. You could have a sphere, you know, you could put the characters like these colored points on a sphere. And again, each one acts and it causes another one to react. And so it sort of ping pongs around inside the sphere. You can go to as many dimensions as you like. So how does that play out in, um, in, in human entertainment or edutainment? And the answer is games and simulations. In a simulation, you can have more than one character, humans or non-player characters. Did somebody say something? I thought we were frozen. Oh, we're good. Um, so, so in a, in a simulation um, where you have human characters and non-player characters, each one has to have an idiosyncratic uh, set of fears and desires. And that generates this ping pong effect, which generates a drama and it has to obey Clancy's theorem or else it comes to a screeching halt. So go ahead, Stacy. I just so I just want to give a real world example because I was going to go to you later and actually ask you. Imagine we were playing this game. The goal of the game is to create the most flourishing economy that's sustainable. So as me, Stacy, the contestant, I'm going to go to Barry because I really am going to do this anyway. And I'm going to say to you, I have an idea for being able to do um, something using the fairy tale of Cinderella, along with your whole, um, you know, your whole model, whatever, your whole theory on the emotions of cognition and learning. Right. And so what I'm coming to you to say is I have somebody like Jen in mind to be on that team. Yeah. And I would go to Jerry and OGM and say, do we know anything, anybody who does educational software? And you would tell me who that is and we would meet them. There'd be a profile, whatever. There might be a few people. And after everybody gets to know each other, they can form into their little teams of what their project for this game or this competition is going to be. Now, along the way, if I'm, and I, I know I'm, who, you know, I'm gonna pick, I think I'm the best director, let's say, for argument's sake, we all think we're the best director. So I get to direct my show and my show is the team and I am picking to lead the team, Dr. Barry Court. And I am picking, you know, so-and-so and I am picking so somebody else for business that I, that, you know, like when you go on Shark Tank and you, you know, that kind of a thing, that's where the game comes in, but that's where people's personal passions come in. And that's where the drama comes in too because we're being watched. That's the reality TV show aspect of it. So conflicts are gonna arise we, and, and that could bring, up, bring in a whole, I mean, there's so many different sprouts that could come off of this. That's why it's so difficult to talk about. <laughs> yeah, I'll stop. <laughs> yep. uh, so you talked about um, optimum economy, I think was the term you used. Uh, well, I want to use the term sustainable economy. Okay, so uh, let's talk about that for a minute because I want to show I want to show a slide here. Um, let's see if share screen is working. Good work. Okay, so let's see. Are you seeing a slide that says multiple interlinked economies? Yeah. Okay, so usually when people think of an economy, 
where's my mouse? They typically think of the classical material economy, the exchange of goods and services for, for money. Okay. And, and that's the economy that economists mainly study, but an economy is actually the flow of some kind of commodity within some kind of a system. And it doesn't necessarily have to be material economy. So for example, we live in an information economy. We exchange bits of information back and forth. And part of the information economy, and Jerry, you might recall back in one of your workshops, I think in the late nineties, one, one of the participants says, uh, attention is the most scarce resource in the economy. I don't know if you can remember. Um, could well be, that, that's yeah. a theory I'm not fond of, yes. So anyway, so there's an information and attention economy because for example, you know, in the advertising, they, they, and sponsors, they, you know, they compete for attention. And so there's this information and attention economy, which is much more abstract. And then there's this entertainment and drama economy, two more economies. Uh, and finally, there's the one that I work on, which is the emotions and learning economy. Uh, and let's see, do I have one more on the bottom here? Let me just see. Yeah. And then there's the spiritual economy. Okay. Now, <clears throat> here's, here's the idea. If, if you know anything about electromagnetic field theory, you know that a changing electric field can induce a magnetic field. And a changing magnetic field can induce an electric field. And so there's a, there's a back and forth between electricity and magnetism, which James Clerk Maxwell found the mathematics for. And so he basically showed that you could have this wonderful mathematical model of two systems electricity and magnetism interacting in a way, well, now, so I don't know if you can see my little inset. It's yes. almost like a slinky, okay? But now look at these multiple economies. The material economy has some activity and flows and fluctuations in the, in the material economy can induce fluctuations and flows in the information and attention economy because they're not independent. And flows and fluctuations in the information and attention economies can induce fluctuations and flows in the entertainment and drama economies, right on down the line. So these economies are interlinked much the same way the electricity and magnetism are interlinked. That is activity in one will funnel on down the line through the sequence of economies, just like a slinky. So when you talk about a game or a simulation that involves economies, you have to take into account that it's not just one of those economies. It's all of them are in play. And some people will be focusing on uh, how much money can I get? There was a game, a children's game called Life. And you, the three goals were um, money, uh, fame, and happiness. And you could decide how much of each you wanted. Well, the same thing kind of applies here that different participants will be seeking um, different amounts of these items. And you don't, you don't know in advance which character cares about this payoff and which character is really looking for some insight, some, uh, you know, some epiphany, you know, some enlightenment, or which one is looking for attention or which one is looking you know, to be the entertainer or the one who's the, who's the great dramatist. So when you think about real life politics and science and religion and philosophy and all that kind of stuff, or even a simulated game, you really have to say all of these economies are in play among the characters. And to the extent that you can um, rec reckon and recognize the interactions among these, you can become a better player in whichever economy you're mainly investing your time and energy in. I think I'll stop there because that's probably a lot to think about. So I won't say too much more until we get some reaction. What I just put in the chat is that this particular game, the way I'm envisioning it, it's designed so that the current, the uh, dominant currency is actually fun and fulfillment. It's set up that way. Emotional that's satisfaction. Exactly. Okay. And the rest will come. So it combines right. all those economies that you just had on that chart. Right. I'm not sure fulfillment equals emotional satisfaction in my head. Well, the way I'm trying to express it, it does. So. 
Okay. <laughs> Ask yourself the question, are we having fun yet? Uh, fulfillment, exactly. Yeah, but it fulfillment to me isn't just emotional. Oh yeah, fulfillment has a certain, does it give meaning and purpose to life itself? Is it not just a diversion, right. you know, just an escape from the humdrum, but am I actually growing in character so that I feel more connected to the world and more connected to the cosmos or whatever you want to call it? You know, that so there's fulfillment is spiritual fulfillment as well as economic. I do I have material well being, but I have emotional well being. Right. So the reason it was put into a game though is to allow for that um, indoctrination to how we feel about money to be taken out of the equation. That's the main purpose of making it a game. It's not that it's not purposeful and that it won't do some really great things. It might do amazing things, but yeah. that's why I say we're actually creating the world. What would an imaginary world look like that we created that's designed to create this kind of economy? And to just add one thing that might make it clearer, this idea started with a question. What would an economy designed to support cultural creatives look like. And that's where this whole idea of this game slash reality show came into play. Yeah, yeah. So, so the, what the drama does, it creates a story. I mean, the, the, the record of the drama is a story and a really good story, you know, has legs. It not only is it a story for the participants, there's also an audience who would be interested in attending in, in, in the mode of an audience, the story. So a lot of the times the best stories come out of real life experiences where people take, take an actual experience and then they morph it into a, a nice compact succinct story to get rid of all the nonsense. And the parts that matter are there. And so in an hour and a half, you can get the substance of the story and not all of the, the noise that sort of disrupted the uh, flow of the story. Yeah, you do it now in a video clip of three to five minutes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. 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 This is one of the problems with uh, these Zoom sessions, uh, especially in, in this group that I'm in with Stacy in Global Challenges Collaboration GCC. They have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of hours, something like, I don't know, a dozen hours a week, week in and week out. And it's, it's mostly noise. I mean, if you go back and say, where in this thousands of hours is there any content, substantive content? It's, it's like a needle in the haystack. It's in there, but you'd have to process an enormous amount of, of uh, dialogue to find the, the gems. So what might you do to call out those gems? Uh, well, one of, the, one of the indicators that you're at a gem is that the emotional impact runs high. Right. And for at least one character, at least one, at least one participant has a strong, high, high energy, emotional reaction. So if you can say we're in here, there are people who are just going along, they're chatting and they're not saying anything interesting. And we're all, the eyes are glazing over, we're bored to tears. So we're just, you know, this word tergiversation, this mm -hmm. is, this is the word where Senator Lindsey Graham can talk for 20 minutes and not say a damn thing. <laughs> <laughs> So where's the part where people come alive? And, and so one of the problems is uh, what kind of an automaton can, can study thousands of hours of video and find the parts where people come alive, high energy, and, 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 and identify the emotion that's, that's in play. That's, I mean, I don't, I don't know if that's even possible with today's AI, maybe it is. So, I mean, uh, one simple thing that I've wished for is um, you know how uh, when, they're, when they're doing market research on whether a TV program's working, they have like a little emotionometer that they right. give viewers and you turn the dial, whether like also when they're watching debates, like, every, oh, that was, this is exciting, this is not exciting, whatever. But what if, there was a, what if there was a much more interesting and useful sort of little control panel where when you hit something you, that, was, that was just noteworthy, you would tap a button uh, or, or click a tag or something or other. So there would be some artifact where you could note, hey, this is meaningful. And then you could also look at of all the participants on this particular Zoom, uh, if more than one of them had a moment at that moment, that's an important moment. So you sort of use collective information to call the pieces. And then, um, I mean, during just a uh, bit of it, let's, uh, let me just share screen for a second. So, so during this call, I have been 
uh, curating. Mm -hmm. And so here's Drama Theory, your page from your website at MIT. Uh, here you are, Barry. I haven't updated you in a long time, uh, but I've now got you under Drama Theory, which I didn't have in my brain at all. I didn't have Nigel Howard in my brain before, but I did have operations research and theories and drama. Uh, and then you mentioned that drama theory was inspired by Much Ado About Nothing, which is a Shakespeare play, which was already in my brain, uh, and also inspired by seeing the cover of John Clancy's book, The Sum of All Fears, which remarkably I didn't have in my brain yet. And that was like, Jesus, seriously? And I didn't have the movie, The Sum of All Fears, but I did have Ben Affleck in, in my brain. And so here's Ben. Uh, and so hold on, beach balling, because my computer is like running hot. There we go. So here's Ben Affleck, right? With uh, Jennifer Garner and Casey, his brother Casey and, and so on and so forth. Uh, Benifer is the single uh, word noun for the couple. And there's, that's next to other couples that have single names. Uh, like Dick and Liz and uh, Tomcat and so forth. Anyway, and these, these are other movies that Ben was in. So I'm busy doing that during our call. And if, this, if what I was doing was timestamped and coordinated with the call, which it ain't, uh, that would then allow multiple participants in the call and anybody viewing the call later to create a rich and interesting annotation <clears throat> of what's going on, right? So here's Clancy's theorem, which I haven't put an explanation in, but I added it. So I'm going to connect that to uh, some of all fears and, and actually uh, Tom Clancy probably. Uh, but, but, and here's your Schreckleich onion layer character model, which I didn't like download into it, but I saw it on the page because I've got your page here in my browser, right? Because I went and looked up uh, drama theory. Right. Okay. So I'm, I'm doing this curation during the call and I do this all the time. Pete Kaminsky is a really, really great maven on calls. He's not curating a shared memory, but he has the uncanny capacity to go discover something, research it quickly, and then put the best possible links back into the group. Um, and that, and he, I think he calls that context weaving. And I think that's a skill people need. Yeah. So, so part of what I think this show could illustrate is what it's in fact like to have ongoing conversations and to do project work and do whatever, and then to cull out the gems and weave them into a bit of an Indra's net. Who net? Indra's net. Indra's net is this sort of uh, uh, long ago concept that there are little little nuggets of wisdom that are woven oh. into a large context or the glass bead game or uh, what I, there's a, a bunch of sort of different metaphoric ideas about what Pro this might Proverbs, be like. Uh, words, words of wisdom. Proverbs. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but how do, we, how do we weave them into a context that is easily accessible to people, more accessible than that brain thing? Because I just gave you a tour through the brain, which when I give you a tour, it makes sense probably. Um, but if somebody just drops in there by themselves, they're like, man, there's a lot of words here. Um, so we're trying to solve for some of that. By the way, um, that, that art, that Encyclopedia article that you showed a bit of, that I showed a bit of, um, the the uh, emotions and learning model, the drama theory model, the uh, the interlinked economies model. That's all in one page on Google Sites, but it's on Google Sites from the original version, and Google is changing Google Sites to a new uh, system, yeah. and the conversion is a disaster. Well, they got rid of the side nav menus. I'm a huge fan of Google Sites. I use it all the time to build simple sites. So and my, I've, my, I've actually grown fond of the new, of the new flavor. My point is, is that I don't know how badly munged <laughs> that, art, that article will become when, when I'm forced to switch over to the new version, which I think the deadline is this fall. Could well be. Um, I, you might just want to like uh, grin and bear it and, and go give it a try. And you might be able to roll back or still find the old version or just export the old website and put it in something else. What I, I may do is, is save it as a PDF uh, because it's not just that article. I got a ton of stuff on Google sites. I bet, I bet. Some, some pages map over to the new version. Okay, some a disaster. <laughs> yeah. So I just yeah, let yeah. you know that 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 page may end up becoming badly munged. So that page being the page of drama theory on your MIT site? No, it's actually on Google Sites. Yeah, yeah, because this does not look like a Google Sites page at all. This looks like a, like a, a, a straight up nine HTML page from 1994. <laughs>
Oh no, the Google, the, uh, see, I wrote the, I wrote the uh, summary article on Google Knoll, the com competitor to Wikipedia. Right. Google Knoll ran for like three years and they shut it down. Yep. So everything got ported over to WordPress, but WordPress was frozen. You didn't dare edit it. Yeah. Because then it would fall apart. So then I ported that over to Google Sites, but that was like around 2011. Yeah. It's been fine on Google Sites. I can edit it and update it and all that. But now it's in danger of <laughs> yeah, yeah. having the same damn problem. <laughs> I, I tried so hard to love WordPress and failed entirely. I tried for a decade and a half to love WordPress. Still do not like WordPress. I will give you, um, I will give you the link to the old version, the current version on um, Perfect. Thank you. sites. And the new version, I've, I'm working on the, you know, the editing of it. And... I don't know if I, if I gave you that link, if you could even see it without. I'm going to tell you in a second. Yes. But it's that, still, that's, still, the, it that's the old up, version. Shows up yeah. as a page. Yeah. So I, if this is a straightforward one, you're not using nav bars or anything like that. I, I should think that if you just move this over, it will not hurt a thing because this is just one big block of, of content. Well, it is, except that um, huh. when, I, when, I did, when I did the trial uh, where I can edit, you know, you know, before I, you know, click the uh, switch over button. Yeah. Um, let me see if I, I, I don't know. I don't know if you'll, if it will let you look at this. You mean to edit it? Uh, very likely not, unless you give me permission to come in and do that. But I'm, no, I because just, it, 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 it's, it's the. Um, yeah, I have to request access, but if yeah. you, so you might be able to. I've, I've been trying to uh, fix all the articles on Google sites before I say, okay, go ahead and switch. And it, it is a disaster. Some articles are okay. Some are just a mess. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know how good this is going to be. So I will note we've, hour. I will note we've gone our hour. Um, Sorry. And I want, no, that's okay. We, uh, this call is set for an hour on Wednesdays. Um, Stacy, I just wanted to check in with you and see where you are with all this. Cause we've gone in lots of different directions from the, the starting point. I just want to get back to Hank's point. So right now, you guys, Jerry, Barry, or whoever, you'd be doing all this tech stuff. You'd be focused on that. But people like Hank and myself or who else, we'd be writing stories, creating the show. And then there could be a whole nother team that's doing the hypothetical business agreements, you know? Um, so it's, it's just, it, it really is creating a world and we'd be doing it. And the, the last part I left out is halfway through this process, we do have two different team leaders and it does become a competition. Mm -hmm. But th there are no losers in that sense because we all own the show. So mm -hmm. there are no losers. Hey, go ahead. You're gonna say um, something? No, let me digest that for a moment. Okay. <laughs> Okay. Um, so, so Stacy, you're sort of trying to preserve the popularity and simplicity of combat style shows like The Apprentice while creating a non-zero sum environment where the game, and are you familiar with the concept of finite and infinite games? Uh, I can imagine what it is. Yeah. So the, there's a writer named James Cars who wrote a thin but good book called Finite and Infinite Games years yeah. ago. And a finite game is played by rules with titles and has a, a known conclusion and there's a winner. An infinite game, uh, basically it's like Calvin Ball. All the rules are changeable and the goal of the game is to continue playing the game. Exactly. Um, and infinite games are more interesting, they're more compelling, and you know, et, et cetera, et cetera. But our world is structured for finite games. Like employment is a finite game. One person holds the title of VP of marketing at a time. That person has rank and authority and responsibility that other people don't hold and can command other people to do things. So your, your traditional corporation is designed sort of as a finite game. And I think this, there's an interesting boundary here uh, in, in and I don't know if game theory has looked into this, Barry, but, but into how to turn more 
of our shared life experience into an infinite game where the commons is enriched as we go rather than zero sum games where the commons is sequestered and depleted as we go, which is the model we got. Like capitalism is a finite game as it's designed presently. It doesn't need to be, I don't think, but it is like right like, now, it absolutely is. It's like Monopoly. Monopoly was designed as a send of a capitalism. And when one person has all the wealth, the game ends and everybody else uh, is, is impoverished. Yeah. It, it was a critique. Uh, it was a Georgist critique of, of early capitalism. And right. that, to that totally failed. It became the model of capitalism. Right. <laughs> and the fact, the fact that one person ends up with 100% of the wealth and everybody else ends up bankrupt was seemed lost on the players of the game. Totally lost. Yeah, so that was like, oh, good, I won. I won. You, you're, right. you're destitute. I've won. It's uh, a game that comes to an end. So the never ending story, the never ending game is the one that doesn't have a final conclusion. Right. As soon as you finish a chapter, it sets the stage for the next chapter. Like Shakespeare says, the past is prologue. So the, 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 the previous uh, round of the game sets the stage for the next advanced layer. It's like each meta layer, each yep. layer of abstraction. But as the, as the layers of abstraction get more and more abstract, you lose more and more players because they can't process at increasingly higher levels of abstraction. When you get up to sort of the, the divinity layer of abstraction, you've lost practically everybody. <laughs> it's like the, at the end of one of my favorite movies, Shakespeare in Love, when Queen Elizabeth says to Master Shakespeare, uh, next time, perhaps something a little lighter, a comedy perhaps, maybe a shipwreck or something. <laughs> Um, anyway, I actually have to, I actually have to boogie from here, but, but um, Stacy, thank you for starting this. Thank you for luring Barry into our, quick, into our nest. Real quick. Yes, please. Uh, uh, real quick. I just want to say that's why this game is an experiment. And that's why at the end, it comes down to two teams because it'll be the leader that thinks we have to do it old school, that this is the way it has to be. And then on the other side, it will be the leader that says, no, we can try something different. And then we could see which one works. Why only two? Because that, that's at the end. Because the whole idea, I mean, optimally, everybody would want to be on one. That would be what we'd really want. But we want to leave room for people that want to do things differently. And here we can bring in Doug Rushkoff and his idea of team human. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Um, thank you for a great call. <laughs> yeah, thank, and this could be episode zero of the whole series. Absolutely, where it began. <laughs> Please. All right. Um, thank you. I will post the recording. Uh, Barry, uh, if you're okay with it, I'm going to add you to the Google group that represents uh, the OGM conversation. And then I'll, in that, I'll send you a link to the Mattermost. Where you, Mattermost is a Slack-like thing. I don't know if you're using either Slack or Mattermost. Uh, but on Mattermost, we have a bunch of frothy discussions. Like our, our interesting conversations are happening over on Mattermost. So I'll send you a link. You just register for a free account. Uh, and you can then find us talking merrily away on different topics and different channels on Mattermost. Super. Thank you. And, and lovely to be reconnected with you. So yeah, it's this been, is, it's this been a while. <laughs> been, been a gift. Uh, and now, my, now your, your, your brain location is more, is richer, is the richer for it. So thank you. Fabulous. Thank you. Bye, guys. Bye-bye.